I'm not a licensed therapist, so always see a professional when you're dealing with these things. My name is Tom. I've dealt with depression since I was 16 years old. I've attempted suicide multiple times. I've been in a mental hospital. Here's my journey with depression. Now, I wasn't always depressed. My story started out really happy. My parents are still together now. They love each other. We came from an upper middle class home in South Jersey. Shout out South Jersey. And he was pretty popular in school. I was never like the best at anything, but I was above average student. I was average at sports. I always had friends. I was always pretty popular in my classes and things kind of chugged along like that. And then high school hit and around, I would say junior year is when I knew something was wrong. Depression for me, like at the time, I got lost a lot of weight. I was always kind of naturally skinny anyway, but I remember a friend's mom making a comment like, Tom, you lost a lot of weight. I think I was maybe 165 at the time. I'm six feet tall. Like right now I'm like 195. So that's, uh, that's pretty skinny for me. I, I lost weight. You know, the typical things, they always give you the depression checklist. Lost weight, loss of interest in things, starting to isolate more. I would come home from school. I'd get home around 3, 3.30, and I would go to sleep. I would just go to my room, say hi to my mom, maybe even have a snack or something. I would just go there, curl up and sleep and I would sleep till dinner time I would wake up for dinner and you know we'd have dinner and maybe if I felt like it I'd do some homework and then kind of rinse and repeat I would do the same thing and that went on for a while and I didn't realize anything was wrong I just thought maybe I was tired you know no one really said anything other than my friend's mom about losing weight but depression wasn't even a thing back then that you talked about it's not like now where you know everybody knows the warning signs everyone knows somebody who's depressed or has some kind of mental illness in their family or in a friend group now it's just a very common thing but back then no one talked about that kind of stuff so of course my grades got real shitty real quick they were never that great to begin with but they got real bad and the depression really got bad the second half of my senior year when all the kids I went to school with who weren't depressed who weren't you know fucking around and getting drunk and getting high on the weekends actually had their shit together and guess what they were going to good schools they I mean they were going to Ivy League schools they were you know trial going to you know college in California and from being from New Jersey is like, oh my God, you got, you made it. You went to California and they're doing all these kind of things and they're setting their life, you know, in motion. They've got majors that they're passionate about. And me, I couldn't get into any college. I applied, I took my SATs, I did okay on them, but I was like not even thinking about college or next steps or anything. Like that's, I don't even know how to describe where my head was, but I just wasn't into anything. So I ended up going to community college, which financially is a great thing. There's nothing wrong with community college. But for me, it was awful because all my friends were gone. They weren't around anymore. They were all off doing cool things. They were in college doing their thing. And I was stuck at home, still living at home. And, you know, shout out to my mom. I was just a terror to live with because I'd be depressed and what that looked like for me was just isolating, not wanting to talk to anybody, sleeping a lot, um, just not wanting to live, not wanting to do anything. There's no suicide attempts at that time, but I just was not happy. But then it would swing from that to the other extreme where I just, for me, I would just erupt and I was just filled with anger and rage at the same time. So most of the time was spent depressed and then just at the slightest provocation, I could just explode. So it was not a good place to be. So anyway, I get my shit together in college. I go to College of Charleston in South Carolina for one semester. And I drank every single day down there and thought I, thought I was having a great time. And of course, uh, they didn't invite me back for another semester. So I came back, finished the community college, and then ended up going to Rutgers Camden, which is a commuter school. So same kind of deal. I, now I have an apartment that my parents are paying for, thank God. Yeah, I, they just paid for it, honestly, to get me out of the house. It was it was worth it to write that check every month for my little one-bedroom apartment than to deal with me. And who can blame them, right? I was an absolute horror. I was so miserable. I just made everyone around me miserable. But I didn't, I wasn't consciously aware I was depressed. I was tired all the time. I would be sad, but I couldn't, I didn't even put the word depression to it. Cause again, no one was talking about it back then. And you know, I, I graduate college and during college I got a DUI. So I got, I graduate college and my license is suspended. So I can't really do anything for six months. So I have this little part-time job and I'm, you know, everybody else is again, you know, I fucked up in high school. All my friends are doing these good things. I fucked up in college 
everybody's out getting good jobs now. And, you know, some are, you know, going to med school, some are starting successful business careers or starting their own business. And my license is suspended and I can't even get a job. I can't even drive to a, to a job interview. So again, comparing myself to others, which you do, right? You compare yourself against your peers, not the best thing in the world to do, but we all do it. And I just felt fucking awful. So I get a job and I got a job selling cars in outside of Philly. Great guy, owned the dealership. I got to know him a little bit and uh, he offered me a job, just class act, you know, class act guy, class act organization. They own like Porsche stores and Mercedes stores. They were all super high end. And it was, you know, I, I liked the job. It, it was no pressure. People came in and just wanted to buy them so you didn't have to scam anybody. It's like people wanted a Mercedes. They had the money for it. They didn't really, you know, try to negotiate too much. Kind of the price was what it was. So the job wasn't too hard. But I remember I would take, the, my license was still suspended. So I would take the train in from South Jersey to outside of Philly every day and you would go over the Ben Franklin Bridge, which is, goes over the Delaware River, which se separates New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And every day, we would go over the bridge in the train, and I would look down, and I would just pray to God that the train would just fucking plunge in the river, and I'd be dead, and that would be it. Every single day. And I would work all day, I would take the train home, I would have to walk home from the train station, because I didn't, you know, my license was suspended and I would get home at like eight o'clock at night, physically exhausted, depressed, and I would just smoke weed. You know, during this time I was smoking a ton of weed. So I would smoke from the second I woke up till I'd be high till the second I went to sleep. I wouldn't really drink during the week because that would beat me up too much. So that was it. I'd just go home, be sad, smoke, go to sleep and repeat. And I, I, I was making good money, but I couldn't even get it, get it like keep it together you know, to buy a nice car for when I got my license back or anything. Like my life was completely unmanageable. I just couldn't seem to get anything together. I was, I'd spend my, you know, the money I made out partying, you know, buying substances or going to, you know, bars or clubs on the weekend. And, you know, my life was just, I was, was not in a good place. And that's the first time I attempted suicide. And it really wasn't a real suicide attempt, which I, I tried that later. You know, I put the gas on in my apartment and I think I even had the window open a little bit. So, you know, obviously nothing's going to happen. But I remember just crying and, you know, just wanting to die and just not knowing what to do or kind of being too scared to do it. So the next day I called my dad and was crying and he's he he's a busy guy. He, you know, has a big corporate job and he dropped everything and took a U-Haul, you know, drove out in a U-Haul to pick me up and towed my car behind the U-Haul, loaded up all my stuff and brought me back to Illinois where they were living at the time to, you know, to figure my shit out and get it together. And obviously they were super concerned. Um, that was the first time I saw anybody about depression. I actually went to a psychologist. Of course, they made me, you know, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to talk about my feelings at all. So I was really in no shape to better myself or help myself at all. Um, and they, that was the first time they, they prescribed antidepressants. And I took them, I don't know, for a while. They worked, I get a little bit maybe in the beginning, but looking back, maybe it was just like a placebo effect, like take this, you'll feel better. And you take it and you go, oh, like, I guess I feel better. But they didn't really work. And I ended up getting it together a little bit and I got a job at a concert venue uh, in Milwaukee and I'm a music nut, so it was a fucking cool job. I was you know, doing marketing for a great concert venue and we get to see bands every night and work with these cool people. And I ended up getting fired from that you know, because I'm high all the time and I'm just angry and, you know, I'm just not a good employer, just not fun to be around. That's when I had my first real suicide attempt. It was before I got the job at the concert venue. I was working for this company that I just, I was doing sales and it was a good company and good job, but I just fucking hated it. And I was still staying at my parents' house and I left for work one day. I was going to do a demo for a customer or something. It was a nice morning and I just left to go to work and it hit with overwhelming depression and just had enough and I wanted out. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced overdosing or taking too many drugs or taking too many downers, especially, you know, your body kind of slows down and it's starting to get colder and 
you know, I kind of felt it coming on and that was it. I, I was leaning into it. And then all of a sudden, this is probably an hour after I took it, there's pounding on my window and it's a, it's a cop. And he goes, I rolled down my window and I'm in my mind, I'm, I'm good. You know, I can put pull it together to talk to this cop. So the cop goes, Hey, what are you doing in your car? Somebody from the store complained you've been here, you know, in this spot for over an hour. And I was just going to reply, but I couldn't even form words. When I opened my mouth, it was just slurring and it wasn't making sense. So the cop knew something was up, um, saw the suicide note. So called the, the ambulance. They took me to a mental hospital. So that was my only time in a mental hospital. It wasn't fun. Um, I was there for a night or two and then they realized that I didn't belong there, I guess, or I didn't, I wasn't in, I wasn't going to harm myself anymore or anything, but I didn't want to call my parents. They, they made me, they said I had to call somebody or I couldn't be released. So who else am I going to call? I called my parents and they came and I remember when they walked in the, the look of surprise, you know, of just sadness on their face. But as soon as my mom saw me, she was hysterically crying. I can't imagine I'm a parent now. And this is my biggest fear in life that my kids have the alcohol or, you know, mental health issues. I do. That's my biggest fear. But I can only imagine her walking into that mental hospital to see their son just tried to kill themselves and just what that must have felt like. I don't even know, you know, and that kept me good for a while. After that, I was collecting unemployment and I wasn't even, I couldn't even get a job. Like I, I don't know how to explain where my head was at the time, but I was just so down and, you know, I guess I was deep in depression at the time where even keep it together for, there was no motivation. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to look for a job. I didn't care what happened to me. You know, I got behind on my rent and I remember a cop coming to the door and give me an eviction notice and, you know calling my parents for help and you know they can only help so much and they're just you know they go we just can't you keep writing you checks you know you got to get it together and my best friend still to this day pat um was living in phoenix i knew him from milwaukee and he said hey come out here you can get a fresh start you can you know sleep on your couch it'll be good for you you know the milwaukee winters cannot be good for your mental health so i go out there and things get worse. It gets to the point without going too much into my sobriety story, because I'll make another video about that, where I'm homeless, really. That's what it, you know, came down to. I couldn't get a job. I wanted to be a radio DJ back when there were radio, you know, radio DJs and people listen to the radio. That's all I wanted to do. And that's it. I wasn't willing to compromise. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about anything. So I was really living in poverty, living off of really handouts from my friend and from his roommates for letting me stay there. That grew old and I ended up basically being homeless. You know, I'd stay at my Pat's apartment or another friend's couch for a night and then they get tired of me or I have to scramble. So I'd stay in a Motel 6 for a night and I had a part-time job and I was just trying to Every day, I was just survival mode. It's like, I need, at the time, it was $65 to get a hotel room at Motel 6. Every day, I was bartending at the time. Great job for an addict. So every morning, all I, I would check out of the hotel and not know where I'm staying that night. And my sole focus was to get $65 to have a place to sleep that night. Most nights, I pulled it off, but there were a couple nights. There was one, you know, one night I slept on a bench in Tempe, Arizona, which was no fun. Like another night where I kind of slept at the bus station downtown until the buses ran in the morning. I just ran the buses all, you know, rode the buses all day because I had nowhere else to go until work. That's how I was living. One day, and this will be in my sobriety story. It's actually, I won't even tell exactly what happened to lead me to get sober. But at my low point, I mean, I was down and out. There was nowhere less to go. It was my rock bottom. People call it your rock bottom moment. And I got sober and I got into a clean and sober house. And I'll tell you that story in my sobriety video. And they made you go to AA and I was, you know, I didn't want to, I've been to court appointed AA before and they just talk about God and I'm not trying to talk about God and whatever. But I had a room <laughs> with a door in a house, which was a step up from not knowing when you were going to sleep that night. So I told myself, I'm like, I'm going to give this 30 days and I'll do whatever they say. And if it doesn't get better, I'll just leave. And it did get better. 
And, you know, I got it together and got a little part-time job and started making a little money. Then, you know, getting a full-time job and then getting my own apartment and getting a car and, you know, all these little milestones. Um, I just kept hitting them. But the fact I wasn't using any more drinking didn't solve the depression problem. It just made it more glaring because I couldn't hide from it anymore. There was, I couldn't go to the bar or, you know, smoke a joint or, you know, do Coke or whatever to get me out of that. Like I was sober and I was stuck with myself. So then I was hyper aware of those, you know, being depressed, you know, going to those rage moments. And I went to a doctor. I went to just my general practitioner when I, you know, go on these you know, four day or week or two week, you know, bouts of depression where I can, you know, barely leave the house. Some days I can have to call out of work. So they would, you know, they would say, okay, it sounds like depression. And then they would write a prescription for this antidepressant. And I take that for a couple of months and then I have to go back and it wasn't working and they prescribe another one. And I literally tried every antidepressant you could imagine and none of them worked you know i just kind of you know dealt with it right you know on those depressed you know depressed days i would just do the bare minimum to get through the day and even now when you know i and i'll talk about what i do now but now when those days happen and they do you know those just sad deeply depressed days i clear everything off my calendar except what it, what i can't get out of the except for those like absolutely have to do today things and usually that's only one or two and then I skip everything else I'm doing good at work I'm you know I'm, I'm getting it together I, I start having these external things back in my life you know I start dating uh you know I never really dated before I got sober I mean I was always okay with women and hook up with a you know a girl at a party or something like that or you know I meet someone but I never really went out on dates and I because I was fucked up you know I didn't care about and, and get, trying to get out of that pain of depression like trying not to be sad trying to get high and feel better like that's all I cared about like girls sex it, I didn't even give a fuck um so you know so now I'm sober and I'm, I'm starting to date again and that's cool and that's fun and that's interesting what really changed and what really where my mental health journey starts where recovery really started was when I met my wife and we started dating and now someone saw all of me where I'm the greatest first date of all time because I can pull myself together you know I can keep you entertained for an hour I know how to ask questions and make it more about you know the woman that you're sitting with instead of all about yourself and get them talking and make them feel comfortable blah 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 I've been in sales my whole life I'm a great first date I'm a fucking awful 10th date because then you've seen me just become enraged out of nowhere or then swing to depression where I can't leave in the bed for three days so then you want to run for the hill. And I don't blame most people for running for the hill at that time. You know, I'd have, I had a string of two, three month relationships and that's where they'd all end up. But my wife, she said, and she kind of gave me an ultimatum. She's like, you got to go to therapy and figure this out. She even found me a therapist because I, of course, I would never do the like work to do it. And I started going and she was a psychiatrist too because so she could write prescriptions. And now I was going to therapy regularly, which helped just by itself that got me better and it helped me start understanding my patterns and just starting to understand myself and kind of you know what I kept doing over and over again and the emotions I was feeling and all that but she kept prescribing the antidepressants and guess what they didn't work before they didn't work now you know we again we tried everyone nothing worked but I'm still going through these dark bouts of depression and winter for me is always the worst you know there's some years where I'm just depressed for three months it always happens around October November you, I hate fucking Halloween because it reminds me of that time of year, right? You set the clocks back. Even as a kid, that means less daylight. That means you get home from school and you only got an hour to play before it gets dark outside. So I hated it since I was a kid. I don't know if, if I need more sunlight or whatever, but it would always get worse. So I had years where, you know, even though I'm going to therapy, even though I got a good job and stuff, even though I'm in a relationship, I'm fucked and I can barely get out of bed most days. So anyway, we get married. My wife's from LA. We move out to LA, but I got to find a new therapist. Of course, my wife finds one because I would just put it off and never go, but she found me one and I went. And this is where it really turned around. Shout out to my therapist, Liz. 
without her, I don't know where I'd be right now. So I'm seeing her for a while and I find a psychiatrist too, who's the right prescription. So I'm seeing both of them and you know, he's trying to get me on a, you know, the right medication and we're trying, none are working. He's trying different combinations. And the worst part is, I don't mean to crap you out if you're like starting to get help for your depression, but it sucks trying to get the right medication cocktail if that's, you know, kind of where you're headed. And I should have said, and I'll say this at the beginning, we'll cut this in. I'm not a licensed therapist. So, you know, always see a professional when you're dealing with these things. But for me, it sucked because it, you know, I'd see the psychiatrist, he'd recommend, you know, he'd write me a prescription for something. I'd take it, you know, it takes a week or two to kick in. Then that, that would come and usually it didn't work. And I think it was working until I went through another, you know, another bout with depression or, you know, in, or rage. And I'm, but I'm seeing my therapist, Liz, through this whole time. And finally, after like a year and a half of seeing her, she picked out, I think it's the DSM, which is like the mental illness Bible, right? That, you know, therapists and psychiatrists use. And it has all the, you know, the listings of mental illnesses. And she said she was watching a video or a lecture about bipolar two. And she said it sounded exactly like me. And, you know, we went through a checklist together and it was me. And the, the hard thing, because when you think bipolar depression, at least when I did, I think of that person who's up for three days running around the house with a knife, you know, in their hand, you know, trying to kill everybody, you know, or running naked down the street. That's what I think of when I think of bipolar. Bipolar two is different where for me, at least it would be, it would spend most of the time as depression. So that's why I was never diagnosed is because yeah, I was depressed. So and that's why I would talk to somebody. So they go, you're depressed. Okay, you suffer from depression. Here, take these meds. But guess what? With bipolar 2, the antidepressants don't work. In fact, actually, they make it worse a lot of the times, which would happen looking back. So she said, it sounds like you. And But I said, yeah, but I don't have like those euphoric highs, although sometimes I do. She said, yeah, but you experience, though, instead of that, you experience, you experience those extreme agitation, you know, ex experience extreme agitation that lasts for days. And I go, yeah, that is true. I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll spend a lot of time, you know, in depression and then I'll just get swing to the other way of irritability and just, you know, being stuck in rage, you know, not for an hour or two, but days. And she said, you should see your psychiatrist about this. So I went and saw him and it took some convincing because it was kind of new at the time. Bipolar two wasn't even a thing. And it's, it's, you know, not a ton of people have it now. So I kind of had to convince him and say like, look, this is why my therapist says, here's the checklist here. Let's take it together. I think I hit all these. He goes, well, some, but maybe not all. I go, look, we tried everything else. Maybe give this a chance because the antidepressants don't work. And by the way, with bipolar two, you know, they make them worse, which is, it has been the case. We've been trying this for a fucking year and a half, trying to get the right cocktail together. It ain't working. Let's treat it with whatever the fuck you treat bipolar two with. Again, it didn't just change like that. And my meds, you know, I do have a positive message at this, but the reality is this doesn't change overnight. And I wish it did. And I wish I could say one thing to you that would make it all turn around for you and you wouldn't be in pain anymore. Or there's this one medication that would change the game. No, it was, we had experiment. Now you have to, I would never want to be a psychiatrist because it's, it seems like an impossible task, right? To try to, you know, get a, the people, the right medication, the right dosage, the right cocktail of them. And probably we tried it for about nine months until we got, stable where, you know, I went a month without having, you know, a bout of depression and didn't become enraged, you know, for a whole day or more. And that was a huge win for me. And my wife noticed it. And during this time, I'm still going to therapy every single week. And now we're getting to the cause of things, right? Now that I'm stable, now the work starts, right? Just like I could never have gotten, you know, mentally fit while I was using you know, it was all fucked up because, you know, you got to get healthy first before you can start dealing with your mental stuff. So, you know, I had to get sober and then it kind of started the journey and then I had to get on the right meds and then the work begun. And then we could talk about patterns of behavior and we can get into fears and we can get into the, 
negative internal critic, which I suffer from all the time and really start to make some changes and journaling and doing all those kind of things. And I still see her every Friday morning at 9 a.m. So don't schedule a call. Don't hit me up at nine on a Friday. That's where I'll be. And just because I was on the right medication and going to therapy didn't mean I was immune to depression. No, I, you know, the winters were still tough for me. So we started doing light therapy. I can't do anything half-assed. Like if I'm going to drink, I'm going to fucking get hammered. Like if I'm going to do light therapy, I'm going to fucking do light therapy. I started out with the little desktop ones, which I would set here at my desk when I was working that would be on, but that wasn't enough. So I got the most high powered one that stands on, <laughs> stands on the floor. That's about this fucking big. And you know, we tried that and that helped a little bit, but I still had winners. Like I remember, I think two winters ago, I was so down and all I could do was work. I couldn't help out with the kids much. I couldn't help out around the house. I couldn't exercise most days, but I would lift weights when I could and I would listen to Kanye's album, Donda. And I'm a huge Kanye guy. He's controversial. He is crazy. He's not a role model. He's anti-Semitic. He's an angry guy. He's just not a fun guy. It sounds like to be around, but that album too was weird. Cause it's not one of his, you know, critically acclaimed albums. It's actually people, a lot of, most people hated it. He, it's like when he found God and he's, he wasn't cursing or, you know, rhyming about the clubs or having those old, you know, sample beats that we all love. But for me, there was like a theme going on of like, you know, coming back to life was like the theme throughout the album. And there was this one song, I forget the name of the song, but it was like Come to Life where it's like a preacher talking in the beginning. And I would just listen to that on repeat over and over again and lift out lift weights in my garage. And I remember crying in the garage when that song would come on. I would drive around and listen to the album and cry. And that was just a bad, that was not a good winner. So I'm never cured of this thing. You know, it's something... I can do, and I'll t- tell you about kind of what I do now to stay healthy mentally. But for me, I don't think it's something I'll ever quite get over. Maybe those days, those depressed days where I can't get out of bed will, you know, reduce greatly and they have. Maybe those, you know, hours of just being enraged will reduce. You know, they went from days to hours to moments now. But now when those happen, I just accept it and I give in to it. When I'm feeling very depressed like that, like I said before, I just kind of give in. There's no fight left in me. I fought it. People say, oh, go exercise, you know, go, go go for a fucking walk. I don't know who these people are, but when you're feeling like me, you can't do anything. You can't, you can't go, I can't go work out. All I want to do is lay in bed. Like I can't fucking put that together. So when those days happen, I just do clear off my calendar, do the bare minimum. And when I get back, I get back on track. And the things now that I do that help me um, stay healthy mentally is, you know, I see my psychiatrist every three months and we just made a medication change like two months ago. So we're still tweaking that and you build up a tolerance to medication or one stops working. So that's always kind of a work in progress. I see my therapist every Friday, like I said, at nine o'clock. I do light therapy in the winter. I know, you know, once October, you know, mid-October comes around, I get that fucking, you know, in crazy light and I set up my office and I keep it on for hours a day. They suppose you're only going to supposed to do it for like 15 minutes. I put that shit on blast like this far from my face and I keep it on for hours at a time. I journal. Journaling really helped me and it was combined with therapy for me because emotionally, if I'm enraged Tuesday and I see my therapist on Friday and I'm in a good mood, I have no way of reliving that moment or even remembering that moment. I would show up to therapy on Friday and go, you know, pretty good week this week. Things are good, you know, not much to talk about, you know, and it'd be five minutes and that would be the end of our session. So then I started journaling when I was feeling, you know, strong emotions, positive or negative, you know, positive or negative, and I would write them down. So then Friday I had something to talk about every week and we could start digging into things like that. Exercise is huge for me. I, I, I've worked out my whole life. Even when I was all fucked up I would and smoke cigarettes and partied, I would still go run a couple miles or go play basketball and smoke cigarettes in between games. So I always worked out since I was a kid. And, you know, 
a lot of my energy goes into that. You know, I work out four or five days a week forever, especially since I've gotten sober. I maybe worked out too hard. Maybe that became an addiction because I just got surgery on my back to replace a disc, which I fucked up for, you know, from years of abusing my body. But exercise is huge for me. It just makes me feel better. You know, I don't know what it is, but I don't know if it's endorphins or maybe I'm getting naturally high, but I need that. It's just something about sweating. And I worked out today. I was at the gym and I was just sweating and I just rubbed it all over my face. Like, I don't know. It just feels good to me to sweat and to work out and the feeling afterwards. So I, you know, I stay up on that and I eat healthy. Like I can't, I can't afford to eat. I got to put myself in the best position, you know, physically, and mentally to kind of battle this thing. So I can't eat McDonald's, you know, and have those crashes an hour, you know, after you eat it. I got to eat clean. I got to eat healthy. I got to limit sugar. You know, I only kind of pick out on sugar a couple nights a week, you know, on my cheat meals. So those are the things that really help me. And I hope really after watching this, I don't know if any of you are still here or any of you were interested in hearing that whole story, but hopefully it helps one person and one person can relate to this. And right now I'm as happy as I've ever been. I'm in a great marriage with my wife who I love more than anything. I have two beautiful daughters that I'm a part of their li lives, you know, a part of all of their lives. I'm dropping them off at school. I'm playing Barbies. You know, I'm going into karate. I'm doing the whole thing and I fucking love it. Right now I'm pursuing my dream job. You know, I quit my job a year ago and I was in financially, you know, we saved and saved and saved to kind of be able to take the sleep. Has not gone well <laughs> overall. Um, you know, I'm, all, I'm looking for jobs now, but I was able to, to pursue a passion and do what I love. And right now I'm actually doing what I love. I love doing this. So getting so much fulfillment out of that. And, you know, I've run marathons of, you know, I've, I've been to funerals. I've done, I just, I learned how to box. I've, I've done so many, you know, I've experienced so many things, good and bad, but I've managed to stay sober through them and mentally I came out of them okay. So look, if you're going through depression right now, if you're bipolar too, you know, get help first. You got to talk to a professional. I'm just a guy on YouTube, right? You got to talk to a professional first, but you've got to stick with it. It's not easy. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever done, you know, this and getting sober, but it's something you just have to put in the work. And I know, trust me, I know when you're <clears throat> in the depths of depression, how hard that is. Like I said before, when I'm depressed, I can't exercise. I can't do shit, right? So you go, Tom, well, how am I supposed to take care of myself? Well, when you are better, take care of yourself. Go to that therapy appointment. Go exercise. Go see the psychiatrist and talk through your issues. And maybe medication will help you. Maybe medication isn't for you. Maybe just going to a therapist or talking to a counselor is okay, you know, will we'll get you there. But I can tell you it's been a long journey and it's been a lot of work, but I wouldn't have traded it for anything because it wouldn't have led me here right now with you and with my family and the life I get to have now. And I'm just much more empathetic to other people and their struggles too because I've been through the fucking ringer. You know, I've been in the mental hospital. I've attempted suicide multiple times. I've been homeless. So when I see other people struggling, I don't have the attitude of just pull yourself together, you lazy fuck, you know, like some people do, like, Ah, they're fucking homeless. Fuck them. They're just lazy or, you know, I don't know why they're not doing better at work. They're sad all the time. Just get it to fucking together. I can, I can show up for work every day. I got shit going on. What's wrong with them? No, I understand that uh, people are going through things that you, you'll never have an idea of what's going on in somebody's head. So just try to be kind to them. And thanks for watching. Hopefully this helped one of you. I'm going to do more solo videos. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. I'm going to do solo videos occasionally. The next one I'm going to do is about my sobriety journey. Sorry if this was a little long, but fuck, my story's long. So thank you so much for watching. And if you're really dealing with with mental health issues right now, call somebody. Go see a therapist today. Call a hotline. There's things you can do today, but just reach out even to a family member or friend. And I wish you the best on this journey. It's long, it's hard, but it's worth it. You're worth it. Life is worth it. Love you guys.